Okay, I think we will start uh, now and hope, hopefully our uh, missing panelists will join us uh, during uh, the introduction. So very welcome uh, here. I'm sitting in Tokyo and uh, uh, we are broadcasting this event as part of the uh, OECD's uh, uh, multilateral finance uh, week. And um, we are very excited to have this uh, opportunity to collect uh, uh, some of uh, the most interesting panelists to discuss uh, the uh, uh, the multilateral finance uh, system and uh, is we have said is the multilateral development finance system fit for purpose and, and that's the the title of, of today's uh, discussion uh, you you know that this system is facing uh, unprecedented challenges uh, it's uh, uh, you have a large and, and increasing uh, gap of, of um, infrastructure uh, and um, that is now also confronted with uh, increasing prices on food and fuel and uh, there is a, a deteriorating debt situation so you know many challenges on top of that of course uh, you have a, a, a slow moving uh, and actually increasingly fast moving uh, climate crisis you have uh, a number of a uh, number of other uh, very difficult issues that uh, the global community is uh, uh, struggling uh, with and um, uh, the the fact that uh, this is all taking place uh, at a time when uh, there is a growing multipolarity and of course, a growing uh, sense of, 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 of distrust or, or lack of trust in the global system makes uh, for a very difficult environment. At the same time, there are now very serious efforts being made to uh, reform the multilateral system. And um, there are uh, a number of proposals uh, on the table being actively prepared. And I don't think I can say uh, in, in my time in, the, in, in working in this uh, system that we have had so many uh, promising and, 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 uh, and uh, 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 relevant proposals. Uh, and the, the G20 is now considering uh, these proposals and working with the multilateral development institutions on uh, whether these, institutions, these uh, proposals can be implemented or not, and we'll come back to them in, in the discussion. I'm sure, and and um, there are new um, ideas for how to new standards uh, on methodologies and, and new instruments, and trying to apply them across the uh, multilateral development banks, and, and trying to find ways of, of, of standardizing and, and getting more out of the system. That's uh, very much on the table. So. Um, it's in against this background that the uh, OECD has published uh, this uh, multilateral uh, development finance uh, report, and um, I, I promised that I would uh, do a little uh, bit of, of a plug for the report and and and, and uh, uh, point out the, the, the main uh, findings, and then we will have a discussions uh, with our panelists. So maybe uh, let me first make this presentation and, and then. Uh, do the introduction of, of the panelists and uh, uh, we will hopefully then have the full panel uh, with us. So um, this report uh, is a, a biannual uh, report that looks at, at the uh, multilateral uh, system and uh, I'm going to now try to share the screen here to Sorry about that, it took a little bit longer than we had hoped. But anyhow, here is the, the uh, a few slides just to uh, give the main points uh, uh, of the report. So, so uh, you know, one thing is that uh, the multilateral system has never been uh, as uh, used as, uh, as it has. And particularly if you look at the, the, um, the uh, diagram to the left here, you can see how 
it has expanded in first in the global financial crisis, of course, and then in, in the COVID-19. So there's no question that the, the system does respond and, and uh, you know, we, we need uh, these institutions uh, to respond to, to uh, these shocks that, that uh, happen. And, um, and it's of course also, uh, uh, you can see here that there are you know, a number of different institutions as the, the of course the, the World Bank Group and then you have the regional MDBs and the UN system and the EU um, institutions, the, the vertical funds. We'll call, come back to, to those in, in a minute. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a, um, a, um, a rich uh, fauna of, of different institutions. But that is also part of the, of the problem uh, that we, there is an increasing uh, uh, um, diversity of institutions and, and maybe also fragmentation. And, and there's a, there are many proposals now on the table, as I mentioned, there's the, the Bridgetown agenda, maybe we'll come back to that as well. There are these proposals um, uh, around the capital adequacy uh, framework that uh, has uh, been put forward uh, by this review by the G20. And, and there is a sort of an increasing uh, maybe sense that we, don't, we are not getting as much out of the system uh, as, as we could. And um, the, uh, the fact that there are these uh, shortcomings maybe are undermining uh, the government's risk, uh, government's willingness to support multilateral solutions and institutions. So that's sort of the, 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 the first sort of paradox uh, in, in, in that we see uh, in this report. And this, the second is uh, paradox perhaps is that the, the, even though countries are actually channeling more and more of their overseas development assistance through this multilateral system, the, the needs are, are so much larger and, and, and the, the, the gap is, is increasing, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks. And, and here you can see it for uh, humanitarian assistance that actually um, the funding gap is just uh, increasing. And um, that is, of course, something that we, we, we really have to, to worry about. And the third paradox that the report points out is that the, the recent efforts to adapt the system to new and emerging challenges really add to the problem. So the fact that we now are creating new institutions to respond to specific challenges and you have these vertical funds, for example, that, that uh, come in and try to uh, address uh, specific challenges, maybe or sometimes also by, bypassing um, existing uh, government structures and so on, that creates um, uh, a, a challenge. And you, so, so you can here you can see how the report looks uh, at this uh, across different areas, and and that uh, uh, is something that we, we probably will come back to in, in, the, in the discussion. And um, it sort of points to 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 the two uh, kind of vicious cycles uh, of uh, multilateral development finance. The, the one is the sort of short term, long term that in you have a, you know, less, you have a less efficiency in preparing uh, for and preventing uh, crisis, uh, crisis. And, and then you have a, a focus on short-term emergency responses, and you have a fewer long-term investments in, in the resilient and multilateral system. And that cycle uh, continues to, 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 to exist. And on the other uh, side, you have this uh, lack of a system-wide accountability. So you have, uh, because of, of, of this other uh, uh, cycle of, of, of um, short-term, long-term, you have the less effective in responding to global challenges. You have uh, increased fragmentation that I mentioned, and you have a uh, sort of a lack of system-wide uh, accountability. So those two uh, kind of uh, um, challenges are, are, are there in, in the system. How do we um, um, uh, deal with, with those? And um, the report says that you know, we cannot continue at, uh, with business as usual. We really need an overhaul of the system. And um, we need to also be, be aware of the um, uh, uh, un unintended consequences uh, or having too narrow a lens. So uh, the MDBs are, are increasingly asked to capitalize on their ability to access uh, financial markets. And, and we are talking about the the, the need for for MDBs to to uh, 
uh, crowding uh, the, the private sector and and also uh, access uh, various um, uh, concessional funding. But but when you look at donor contributions, uh, uh, their um, uh, will, willingness to uh, contribute to MDBs have actually uh, uh, fallen and and. Um, we need to find uh, new funding sources, private finance and, and, and earmarked contributions. Uh, uh, we need to use multilateral resources more strategically. They are, after all, uh, limited, even if we can now increase them uh, a little bit. We, we, they are still very uh, limited relative to, to, the, to the needs and these gaps uh, that I mentioned. So um, how, how do we balance you know, concessional and non-concessional instruments and, and how do we in particular, um, make sure that uh, there is enough resources going to low, lower uh, uh, income uh, partner countries. So given the increased emphasis on climate finance, which goes uh, to a large extent to uh, middle income countries, and there's an increasing concern that low income countries are not getting sufficient uh, support. So those are the, some of the issues that are being pointed out. So. Maybe I'll just stop here and uh, the, sh the sharing, and, and uh, we have a chance to, to maybe come back to some of these issues in the discussion. So here we are. And now we have been joined by our third panelist. So excellent, wonderful. So, so um, this, um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, slight delay. And, and I'm very happy to introduce uh, uh, the panelists. I'll do so. Uh, uh, as they speak. So the first uh, panelist is uh, uh, Murtaza Siad. He's a uh, deputy governor of, of the State uh, uh, Bank of uh, Pakistan. Of course, Pakistan is very much um, in, in, uh, in our thoughts uh, at, at this point in time because of what Pakistan is experiencing with the floods. And of course, it is uh, an example of, of the kind of uh, challenges that the multilateral system is, is facing and, and I'm very proud actually to say that we, AIB has just approved uh, a loan uh, to, to Pakistan of 500 million and, and uh, that will be used to, to uh, address the, the, the damages but of course the, the next step is to also try to uh, do something uh, to make uh, great, greater resilience against uh, future shocks and so on. But maybe you can say something about, from, from your perspective uh, in, in Pakistan on, uh, about uh, these um, observations about the multilateral development finance system. Please, Murasa, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eric, and uh, sorry for having been a bit late to join the webinar. It's really a pleasure to be part of this panel. And uh, I think we are discussing some very, very important issues and I enjoyed very much your summary of the OECD report, which I think makes some very, very good points about the need to reinvent the multilateral development finance system, and in particular to look at new challenges that are that are now confronting the global system, and also to address the fragmentation and the sort of polarization that unfortunately the global economy has been beset by in recent years. Let me just um, uh, make a few points from the perspective of Pakistan. Um, and maybe I, I will tell you a little bit about how we have benefited from the multilateral development finance system, particularly in the last three years, as well as some of the frustrations I think that we have felt. Um, and in some ways, Pakistan is a canary in the coal mine uh, because the challenges that are being faced by Pakistan right now are perhaps a precursor to the challenges that low-income countries and middle-income countries will increasingly face as we go forward. So Pakistan's um, uh, uh, challenges right now are to do with, of course, um, the exit from COVID, which uh, you know, was, was a, a global pandemic that also affected Pakistan, although Pakistan did quite uh, a lot better than most countries in the world with the help of the international uh, development finance system. Uh, so one of the challenges, of course, is to, is to try to make sure that the COVID recovery is sustainable. At the same time, there have been large exogenous shocks that the whole world is going through right now. The tightening of global financial conditions with the Federal Reserve tightening uh, in, in a way that we have not seen in many decades. Uh, this sharp super commodity, uh, super, you know, commodity super, price, super cycle that we're going through, which is straining 
the fiscal budgets of a lot of countries, particularly with food inflation, energy inflation being so high. And also overlaid with all of that is climate change and the effects of climate change that are now becoming more and more apparent across the world. In Pakistan's case, unfortunately, we had these floods over the summer that affected uh, one in seven uh, people in Pakistan, 30 million people, a lot of people affected by this. Almost half of the country was inundated by, by water for a couple of months. So we did see the cataclysmic effects of climate change in a very visible way in Pakistan. So as, as we are facing these challenges, we have had to rely on the international community for assistance, in particular on multilateral development banks and other international financial institutions. And we have had some good experiences and we've also had some frustrations. And I'd like to talk a little bit about those. The, the, the good experience I think has been that during COVID, uh, the system really helped in terms of containing the loss of lives and livelihoods in Pakistan. We benefited from the International Monetary Fund's uh, rapid finance uh, uh, facility, which is a conditionality free uh, 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 facility. They put the existing IMF program on hold for a little while and allowed us to do whatever was necessary to take care of, of our people. There was also quite generous support from the World Bank, uh, particularly in terms of uh, financing through the COVAX facility for the vaccines as we went forward. And the G20's uh, debt, sustainability, debt suspension initiative, the DSSI, was actually very, very useful as well in creating fiscal space. So that was the good part of our experience. Uh, there have been bad parts, and then there have been a, a couple of what I will call ugly parts as well. So there's a the good, the bad, and the ugly. The bad, I think, experience that we are now going through is that the coordination among uh, the multilateral development banks seems to have weakened over time. In Pakistan's case, in the past, whenever we had an IMF program, the other donors would piggyback off the program and there would be you know, uh, 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 quite a lot of assistance that we would get through that catalytic role that the IMF plays. This time around, we are finding that even though the IMF uh, is on board with Pakistan, some of the other donors are hanging back. Uh, and that is creating, I think, some greater fragmentation than we have seen in the past. There are reasons for this. I think it's partly because of the rise of China as well, which I will come to in a second. But the coordination among multilateral development banks to us has been a bit frustrating. The ADB and the AIB here, I must say, have been uh, welcome departures from this. We have seen very good coordination between the two, and we have benefited a lot, actually, uh, including through the very generous uh, assistance that we received uh, yesterday from the AIB. Uh, the other bad part of our experience, I think, has been the amount of financing that we've been able to get, uh, both from the IMF, but also from the multilateral development banks. Because Pakistan happens to be a lower middle income country, we cross the IDA threshold on certain amounts of assistance. We have found that the level of money that has come into Pakistan has not been commensurate with our needs. That has been another, I think, frustrating um, uh, part of our experience. And in terms of the bad, the, the last one is that there's too much conditionality, which is sometimes not commensurate with our capacity and our needs, particularly given that we are going through uh, uh, a very sort of bad climate related disaster right now. Again, here I will say that the AIB stands out because conditionality is not part of the way that they, they lend. They do uh, provide assistance uh, on the back of uh, what the ADB has just provided to Pakistan, but you know, generally conditionality free kind of lending is makes a lot of sense when you've been hit by a natural disaster. Now, let me come to the perhaps the most frustrating part of, of, of uh, uh, our experience, what I will call the ugly part. I think, first of all, the ability of the system to engage on longer term uh, issues like climate change and sustainability uh, are not yet very well developed. Uh, we have seen in Pakistan's case, we are fairly keen to issue a green bond we, of course, want to do whatever we can to help the people that have been affected by these, by these terrible floods. But it has been difficult, I think, to engage with the multilateral development banks on this agenda. And I think this is partly because it's not really part of their mandate right now, and they're still feeling their way through how to deal with uh, a slow moving and longer term issue like climate change. And finally, I think probably the ugliest part of our experience has been that the multilateral development system seems to have now, um, there's a great risk of it fragmenting. And I think it's partly to do with the rise of China and the tensions that that is creating geopolitically. And we're finding that in, in China's case, 
it is a very important development partner in Pakistan and has been very usefully focused on infrastructure rather than budget support, which is kind of what the other multilateral development banks have moved towards, but particularly the World Bank uh, and the ADB. Uh, and yet the rise of China and its growing exposure in Pakistan seems to be creating some discomfort among some of the other partners. And that is affecting countries like Pakistan uh, in a bad way. So let me just end by saying that I think we are at a critical juncture. We do need multilateral development banks to be even stronger. They were one of the most successful inventions after the, the World War, and we do need them to be stronger. But there is clearly a need for reform. And I hope we can get into some of the some of the ideas for reform in the in the in the panel discussion. So let me leave it there, Eric, and I look forward to uh, to the questions. Thank you very much, Murtaza. I think it was a very uh, interesting and and and, and thought provoking uh, uh, reflection on on the on the Pakistani experience. And so I'm sure we'll come back to to some of your observations there. Uh, can I uh, leave the uh, the floor now to to Professor Xu Yajun? And she is the uh, deputy uh, dean, executive deputy dean of the Institute of New Structural Economics at uh, Beijing University. Uh, Beijing University and, and her uh, institute have been uh, collecting uh, a huge amount of information on uh, the uh, uh, multilateral development or the development finance institutions in, in general and doing a, 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 a delivering a global public good by, by uh, creating uh, data sets around these institutions that so that we can understand them then better. And, and you have worked on, on many aspects of the development finance system. So please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Eric. So I'm very delighted to have the opportunity to join the panel discussion today. First of all, I would like to give my congratulations on the launch of the report on multilateral finance in the year 2022, which has provided a comprehensive overview on the key challenge that the multilateral financing system is facing today and make policy recommendations on how to ensure multilateral finance is fit for purpose to deliver on the 2030 agenda. And one key recommendation from the report is to develop a holistic vision for the multilateral development system to ensure its fitness to meet the global development challenges. And in my remark today, I would like to build on this recommendation to make three points from an Asian perspective. First, what the holistic vision would be. And second, why public entrepreneurship is needed to achieve this vision. And third, how we can reshape the international rules of official dealing finance to harness the process of public entrepreneurship as a force for good. So let me start with the first question. What the holistic vision would be. So at the heart of the 2030 agenda is a transformational agenda, the drive to achieve economic structural transformation in a sustainable and equitable manner. And this could serve as a holistic vision of the multilateral finance system. And this vision goes beyond the basic needs approach of millennium during the goals, the MDGs, it emphasized that the economic structural transformation is a key engine of achieving large scale poverty reduction and economic prosperity. And this I think is also the key lessons we learned from China, which has managed to lift more than 800 million people out of poverty in the past four decades. And it also highlighted that such an economic transformational approach has to be achieved in a holistic manner within the boundary of nature and social cohesion. So this, I think, could be served as a holistic vision that we can embrace in the coming years. And then I'd like to move to the second point. To achieve this vision, why do we need public entrepreneurship? So to achieve this holistic vision of economic structural transformation in a sustainable and equitable manner, we have to go beyond the piecemeal effort of foreign aid and to foster the spirit of public entrepreneurship. So what do I mean by public entrepreneurship? So it is a capacity to organize, scale up, and sustain the long-term finance. And there are three interactive dimensions here. First, we need to have a comprehensive long-term vision. 
So the transformation process of moving from a largely traditional economy with relatively low productivity to a largely modern economy with high productivity takes at least one generation. Planning and a grand vision is crucial to marshalling public resources in concert with private resources for fulfilling this vision. If you look at the economic history, we can see that the spirit of public entrepreneurship is at the heart of the transformation process in US, in Germany, and in China and other East Asian tigers. So this is the first key dimension of public entrepreneurship. And the second key dimension is to act on very decisive scale, even in the presence of uncertainty and risk. The large scale transformational agenda entails an order of unprecedented complexity and magnitude within a long-term horizon. So at the initial incubation stage, this is often beyond the reach of private actors whose range of action usually constrained by short-term short or medium-term performance criteria. Therefore, you know, public entrepreneurship is crucial to overcoming dividends and inaction to create the future. So this is very important. And then the third key dimension of public entrepreneurship is the creation of a learning by doing society with spreading innovation. So learning by doing strategy trigger and sustain the transformation agenda by coordinating effort of multiple stakeholders and enabling bottom-up initiative to flourish and scale up. So therefore, you know, we need public entrepreneurship to achieve this transformational agenda. Despite its crucial significance of public entrepreneurship, the current international finance system has not been successfully geared towards generating the spirit of public entrepreneurship. And this is largely due to a set of pathology, including the imperative to meet short-term, tangible performance target and the mis misperception of risk, which creates the first mover problem. Nobody wants to be the first one to enter into the, the market. And the aid agency incentive structure, which fail to foster the mindset and the mandate that can engage in scaling up project and building systematic capacities. So for example, take the clean energy transformation, for example, currently many effort has been focused on make the individual project bankable, but this is not sufficient. In my research, I've convened the energy chief from leading during banks, and they have highlighted some systematic talent. For example, there's lack of supporting infrastructure like transmission line and distribution lines. And there's also a lot of incumbent entrenchment of fossil fuel. And, and also developing country lacks the manufacturing capacity to produce the renewable energy technology in a competitive price. And these are systematic challenge that calls for you know, the concerted effort to go beyond the product level approach. So in the recent years, we have witnessed the renaissance of public entrepreneurship. So on the international level, we see China and other emerging economies has established AIIB and Northern Bank, which has provided much needed long-term capital to finance green infrastructure. And on the national level, we have seen both developed country and developing country uh, have, have established or in the process of planning to establish their own banks. As Eric mentioned earlier, I'm leading a team to build the first global database on their banks worldwide in collaboration with French Development Agency. We have identified 500, 520 plus banks worldwide and hold cumulative total asset at up to 23 trillion. So if we can harness this you know, public finance to unleash the spirit of public entrepreneurship, I think the potential is huge. But the public entrepreneurship paradigm is not free from risk because political interventions could abuse the prudential financial judgment that can lead to debt or financial crisis. So therefore, you know, this leads to my final, my last point is how to reshape international rules of official dealing finance to harness the process of public entrepreneurship as a force for good. So to achieve this goal, we need sound international rules in place to get the incentive right 
to unleash the potential of public entrepreneurship while avoiding undue political intervention that may lead to financial and debt crisis. So I would like to take you know, the debt surveillance framework of the Bretton Woods Institution just as example to illustrate my point. So the Bretton Woods Institution have established the debt surveillance framework to ensure long-term and sustainable capital flows. And the core challenge in establishing an effective multilateral debt surveillance system is to deter the imprudent lending and borrowing without unduly constraining borrowers from obtaining much needed long-term investment. So initially in the 1960s, you know, IMF, you know, they they uh they started with a debt limit policy that aimed to speed up the restoration of confidence in economic management of, of the borrowing countries and in order to hasten the inflows of long-term capital. But in the 1970s, this framework has shifted towards an ex-ante deterrence of external finance. So they would try to deter the expensive loans which is called non-concessional loans. And this framework has become too stringent and which has, you know, which has aroused a lot of critique from emerging economies and, and developing countries. So at the request of emerging economies, this surveillance framework has been reformed in the 2010 and later on in 2018. And we try to take into account the two objectives on the one hand, to deter the improvement in lending and borrowing, and on the other hand, to give the right incentive to the official finance pro providers to ensure that they can unleash the spirit of public entrepreneurship to invest in projects that would in line with the latent competitive advantage of the borrowing countries, and to enhance the debt service capacity in the future and during the process, and we, we are able to achieve the economic transformation that we, we want to embrace. So I hope that you know in, in the future you know we can, can we can devote more effort uh, to this kind of international rules and incentive system to ensure that we can achieve this holistic vision as we envisioned. Yeah, back to you, Eric. Thank you. I think your your vision is very uh, fitting with your background <laughs> with the rainbow and and uh, you know you you have a, a certainly a vision. Uh, to address some of the issues that Murtaza was was referring to, the the, yeah. the lack of co coordination across the system and, and the, the potential, if we could bring together these balance sheets and 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 if we could standardize uh, um, uh, lending criteria and so on across institutions, we, we could get so much more out of the system. Um, and and of course, it also brings us to you because you you spoke about the need to mobilize the system towards these uh, fundamental global challenges that we have uh, and, and uh, also which of course uh, uh, Mutata was referring to when, when he spoke about the that you know the, the system is not really yet set up perhaps to fully address um, climate change for example and and uh, so we, we are still uh, looking for for the format uh, even if all I think now MDBs are trying in one way or another to to um, to uh, address uh, uh, the, uh, the climate uh, uh, threat. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the the next uh, uh, panelist, uh, I don't know, are you, you are having problems with the the video connection, perhaps. Uh, uh, it's uh, Jung Tae Yong uh, is the professor at the Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei. University and I had the, the privilege actually earlier this week to, to visit uh, uh, Yonsei University and and uh, and and and, and the, the exciting research team that uh, uh, Taeyong is is uh, uh, working with and and uh, and of course you have a long background working on on climate change and being part of the IPCC and and maybe uh, you could bring in uh, your perspective on this. Uh, you know, particularly on the, you know, how the system is uh, set up to deal with climate change and, and what we can do to, to improve it, to, to maybe met, better respond to this, to this challenge. Let me, let me quickly uh, say what I want to say. Eric, first of all, thank you. And uh, the 
you know, I, I mostly uh, agree with the, your point and the two panels, uh, uh, you know, point. But if I may add a couple of things, the first one is, uh, let me just focus on the climate change, okay? And uh, last April, we IPCC released the working group three report and uh, over there to achieve our global target, uh, 1.5 or 2.0 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. You know, the scales, the investment requirement are totally different. Uh, it's, we are talking about trillion, okay? And uh, we say two, uh, two degrees Celsius, it's more than $2 trillion. If we uh, reach to our uh, ambitious target 1.5, that it means $4.7 trillion every year up to 2030. This is a totally different game. Okay, uh, even if I agree with the both panels and Eric, uh, let me give you just a simple couple of numbers. Okay, uh, in your slide, uh, you said that the MDBs and the multilateral agencies, they did their best and reached to 200 uh, something billion. Yeah, three digit uh, numbers. No, I, I think two digit numbers. Then uh, MDBs and uh, you know their operation annually is again, I think at best two, two digit. AIAIB, I don't know, but at best two digit billion dollars, yeah? annually. Mm -hmm. And even if for you MDBs are very good uh, to, to uh, mobilize the resources so that uh, you have factor 10, then we are talking about three uh, digit uh, billion dollars. And we need the four digit uh, numbers. So there are obviously a lot many gaps. And uh, our uh, Pakistan, uh, the colleague said, let me just focus on the climate change issue. Uh, how are we gonna fill this gap? And first, I think we have to re reconsider, restructure our existing uh, multilateral system, Bretton Woods system, UN system, whatever. I think it's too old. I think it's more than two generation already. So it's, a, I'm sorry to say, but it's about time to think about innovative, uh, restructuring of uh, this uh, system, or are we going to think about new innovative uh, 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 system? Otherwise, we cannot really feel this uh, 10, uh, you know, uh, the 1,000 digit billion dollar gaps. We are talking about trillion dollars from now on. And uh, I think uh, whatever you, you mobilize the public resources, bilaterally, multilaterally, we feel far, far much gaps. So then obviously we have to ask the next question, how then we gonna mobilize it? Well, uh, I think private sector is the uh, one solution. I think uh, the, our Chinese colleague uh, mentioned the public entrepreneurship, including that one, I think a private uh, sector, simple. They have more money, they have more resources, they have more human resources, and they have technology. So how to engage them to tackle this global issues is a real challenge to every, everyone. One, one way is this one. Look, this is a global public good, so you have to do it. I don't think it works, okay? Because they are different animals. So I, I think the first uh, uh, the issue that we have to think about is how to make them attractive. Uh, you know, according to IPCC review, we know that the globally financial resources are available. Huge amount of money is hanging around here and there, but not in climate change area. And we have to think about why. That why is one of the reason is we public uh, sector, nationally, multinationally, internationally, we don't pry, provide them enabling condition. We don't really give them favorable conditions so that the private sector, okay, I'm gonna make the money jumping in this area and then do my business. We don't provide such a environment. I think that's the starting point for me to, to highlight. So that uh, the private sectors 
they jump in and then do their own, then they gonna, they gonna really provide us much innovative solutions and much better ways. And finally, as uh, I think uh, uh, the, our, uh, the Pakistan colleague said, I think uh, the global community and multilateral agencies, your one of your job is to share our experience. Our experience doesn't mean that I, I just uh, uh, ask successful stories. Okay, we have a lot of many, Korea, for example, we have a lot of many successful stories. China, yes. But I think uh, we have to share the also our failed stories so that our other, other part of the uh, world, they, they don't make the same mistake that we made. That's the, I think, one way to, to minimize global social cost of implementing uh, this uh, climate change issue or other global commons. And I think multilateral agency like AIIB or other MDBs or UN agencies, don't try to give the money to the uh, recipient countries. I think money is not the only uh, way. I think you have to really facilitate, provide the knowledges and experience of other successful or failed uh, stories so that we can share the lessons. I think those two are my point. And I'm sorry for some problems of uh, uh, connections, but I hope uh, you could get my point. Thank you, Eric. No, uh, thank you very much. And I think it uh, complements very nicely what, what was said. And then uh, also really you point to the, the, uh, the scale of the, the challenge we are facing and, and the, the, the need to, to somehow uh, uh, bring in uh, the private sector. And, and of course, this is the, the ultimate challenge. And it's, it's not just the private sector, it's the, actually the institutions and, and the institutional capital uh, also uh, we, we are all thinking about how how we can 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 do this, and and, uh, and as you say, also it's not only about capital; it's also about uh, making sure that we share experience. Uh, uh, we are going to have some uh, questions and answers, I hope, from from the audience. Uh, but uh, maybe um, before we, we we do that, I wanted to to have a, a round of, of um, uh, comments, perhaps from from. Uh, uh, you uh, having listened to each other and then maybe going back to you, Murtaza, you, you, I think you got sort of responses to, to some of your concerns here about the, you know, the fragmentation, the lack of coordination in the system, the lack of preparation uh, in terms of, of, uh, of, of uh, preparing for, for, issue, for the challenge of, of, of climate change. What are your reflections uh, also to the solutions of, of uh, you know, bringing in uh, private sector. I mean, these are things that we are obviously talking about, but uh, can we really deliver? And what what do we need to 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 really deliver on the scale that uh, Taeyong is talking about? Yes, thank you, Eric. I think uh, what uh, Taeyong has just uh, said is very very important to keep in mind. I mean, I think the scale of the challenge is is obviously formidable. Uh, but yet, I think that the multilateral development banks are perhaps the best uh, best placed to try to coordinate the effort that we will need against climate change. And in this context, of course, recently, uh, Treasury Secretary in the US, Janet Yellen, has made some very, I think, encouraging remarks in terms of uh, showing leadership on global development cooperation and uh, calling for reforms of multilateral development bank uh, mandates, in particular the World Bank, to try to include things like climate change. So I think there are perhaps two, two uh, things that can, be, that can be put on the table. One, I think, is, is part of this review that was done, that was commissioned by the G20 on the uh, capital adequacy frameworks of the, of the multilateral development banks. You mentioned that in your uh, comments as well, Eric. And I think there are some very good ideas there that uh, should be looked into. I think over time, multilateral development banks and shareholders have uh, become a bit comfortable with a, quite a conservative uh, approach to their financial policies, even though they are, you know, very safe institutions. They have stellar repayment records. The borrowers from these multilateral development banks prioritize repayment to them because they're viewed as development partners that they can rely on year after year. Um, but I think there is there is a scope to to unlock uh, uh, more 
uh, funding from these multilateral development banks. In particular, as part of this review, there was an interesting suggestion to uh, uh, you know, reform callable ca capital that these multilateral development banks have. This is the capital that's not paid in, but can be called in if needed. And that can help boost the lending power. I think as part of this review, there was a there was a figure of $500 billion that could be unleashed if you had a little bit more of a permissive attitude towards callable capital. I think here, um, there's also a need perhaps, and this was also part of the recommendations from this review, to redefine the risk tolerance that uh, multilateral development banks have. Right now, it's being driven uh, largely by credit rating agency assessments because multilateral development banks would like to keep a very high credit rating. Uh, but I think there is, a, there is scope perhaps to move towards more realistic assessments of the risks that multilateral development banks are taking and use, use the, the credit rating agencies more as an external evaluation tool rather than embedding them into the, the, the uh, internal policies. Here, of course, it'll be important for uh, uh, better data to be given to the credit rating agencies the, so that they can also uh, be more comforted that the risks that are being taken by the multilateral development banks are, are manageable. And I think here, uh, you know, financial strength of the multilateral development banks, uh, uh, giving some more data and analytics on their balance sheets would help demystify some of their financial models that are contributing to this very conservative attitude. So there is scope, first of all, to make much more use of the existing capital that multilateral development banks have. And of course, you could argue that perhaps there's a need for a capital increase as well, perhaps a green capital increase, one that is devoted to financing climate change type uh, uh, projects. So that's, I think, one line that could be pursued. And I think the work that was done by this independent review is a very good one. In terms of the other leg, how to uh, get more private capital to be catalyzed, I think there too, there are a few things that uh, one could think about. Because right now, the risk reward sort of calculus doesn't really uh, support private capital, as uh, Tai Jung was saying. Uh, we need to change that, and multilateral development banks can do that using their financial instruments like guarantees, uh, like their equity investment, like co-financing certain projects to give comfort to the private sector that what they're investing in are good projects. And there, there is also a need for the multilateral development banks to work with the recipient countries to help them build up their capacity to put on the table good projects and to think through uh, what are the kind of projects that are needed to move towards a low carbon future. I think there's a lack of understanding in many countries, including in Pakistan, about exactly what it will take to get onto this low carbon future. So there's a lot of, I think, uh, hand-holding and technical advice also that the multilateral development banks can give to try to de-risk uh, some of the private capital that needs to come in to fund the climate change uh, transition. And finally, I think related to this, it's very important that the multilateral development banks ensure that the investments that are being made for climate change do actually help the countries because there's going to be a lot of money involved. And they're you know, having transparent procurement standards high environmental standards, ensuring debt sustainability. The advisory side of what the multilateral development banks do will also be very important in addition to the financial firepower that they themselves can bring and the private capital that they can catalyze. Yeah, I think you, the, the, the last part is very much uh, along the lines that uh, Tayong was uh, emphasizing as well. And, and you know, there is much more than, than capital needed here. here and, 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 and you 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 spoke uh, quite a bit about the the capital adequacy uh, review and or framework review and and I think that is uh, uh, when I was talking about the promising ideas and and the things that actually could uh, perhaps be implemented. Uh, it it is very interesting that this uh, set of proposals that are you know they are individually can be implemented, but the the, the most interesting would be perhaps if they could be implemented as, as a package and that could really uh, change um, the uh, the whole uh, the whole scene and and uh, they are now uh, also being pushed by uh, the uh, indian d20 presidency and and they are asking uh, the multilateral development banks to 
with their boards consider these proposals and report back uh, by June uh, next year. And, and as you said, some of these ideas are probably not so much for the individual MDVs to, to push because it's not so easy for, for each one to um, start discussing the role of callable capital, for example, you know, the, you know what is the standing of callable capital is, is really something for the shareholders to, to discuss uh, rather than the, the individual uh, financial institutions. And, and of course, uh, also some of, of the issues uh, around rating agencies are, are, are um, also probably not for the individual. It's very difficult perhaps even for the individual institutions to start uh, discussing this, but we can do that as a collective and, and the shareholders as collective. And, and very interestingly, uh, there was a, a recent uh, uh, piece by Standard & Poor's where they actually go through the, the, the CAP review and, and you can see how they have actually been influenced by both the, the, um, the reasoning, but also the, the data that uh, are being brought for, forward in, in this uh, review. And, and there are some really striking things that, that substantiate what, what you were saying uh, around how um, countries treat the multilateral development banks different from, from other lenders. And, and uh, this is uh, something that should be taken into account when you assess. The, and it should, of course, also be reflected in, in how these institutions set their own uh, standards when it comes to putting capital aside and so on. Uh, well, you know, all these things are about, uh, you know, how uh, the the system works. And, and uh, Professor Shi, you have you have uh, very much uh, been thinking about this. And, and uh, Murtaza spoke about the, the 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 value of the data. That's actually something that also the CAP review brings out that if we can use the the credits. Uh, data, the default uh, data on, of these institutions, uh, that will uh, be very valuable both for, for them themselves as they uh, look at, at how they determine uh, their, uh, how much capital they keep, but also for, for of course, um, for the, the investors and for the markets. Um, on, in your efforts to collect data on these institutions, is that also one aspect you are looking at or, or how, how do you see yourself in, in in this, in this effort um, relative to the sort of the, the CAP review and in your effort to, to collect data on the system and, and, and bring a better understanding uh, for how these institutions, the specific uh, characteristics of these institutions and how, mm -hmm. how they can be reformed to, to better fit uh, the challenges we are facing. Yeah, exactly. So the motivation behind building the first global database on German banks is try to understand what these, you know, the essential features of these institutions and how to find the appropriate institutional arrangement that can fit for purpose. So I would like to echo the point made by Motaza earlier that we need to reform the rating methodology of credit rating agency that has been acted as de facto regulators of the MDVs. If we want to scale up the lending capacity of MDB from, from billions to trillions. And a complementary point on, on, this, uh, on this question is about the regulatory framework of national loan banks mm -hmm. that uh, my database has tried to collect. So based on the questionnaire survey uh, in my database, uh, database building pro process, we have realized that about two thirds of MDBs, national loan banks, tell us that they comply with the identical regulatory framework as commercial banks in their country. And this, you know, it's, that is a battle accord. And this is problematic in their view because this may undermine their ability to provide long-term finance to fulfill their uh, obligations, to fulfill their mandate. So I think in the future, what we can do is really to have more concerted effort among the other banks and try to find the appropriate financial regulatory framework that will help to achieve the goal on the one hand to ensure the financial soundness, on the other hand, to make sure that this regulatory framework provides the right incentive for these banks to provide long-term and high-risk capital and to play a counter cyclical role in times of crisis. So this is the first point I, I want to make. And then the second point I want to echo is what Professor uh, Tang Yongjin made earlier, that, that there's, there's not a lack of capital. What, what is lacking is 
the right financial intermediary that can channel the private capital to the productive investment. So I think one way that we can encourage private capital to achieve, um, you know, the climate to to combat climate change is to incubate the green bond market. So the green bond market, when it was first, first introduced by European Investment Bank in 2007, it has been in, it has been uh, growing very rapidly in recent years, especially after the intro, uh, introduction of the green bond principle in 2014. But the absolute amount of green bond is still very small, only a, account for about 1% of the total uh, bond market. So one major concern of the investors is about the greenwashing. So they basically, you know, so this is a real concern and how development bank, especially MDBs can lead by example, can make tangible example on how we can build a tangible link between the green bond proceed and the, the green project on the ground and try to alleviate the green washing concern and to help to incubate the local green bond market by issuing the local, you know, uh, the bond denominated in local currency. So I think this is something that, you know, uh, that both academia and practitioners can work together, you know, in, in the coming years that we can have to unleash this full potential of private capital in working towards uh, this, um, you know, competing climate change. Yeah, that's my my other thought. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree with this challenge that we are facing. That that uh, you know a lot of these new uh, technologies and and a lot of these investments in renewables now is actually happening in in, in foreign currency in countries that are already often indebted and and uh, getting you know more exposure in in foreign currency is not in the interest and most of the Revenues generated under these uh, investments are in local currencies. So you would like the finance yeah. in local currencies. It's just very, very difficult uh, given the macro situation in these countries to, to have local currency financing. So, so, but uh, I very much agree with this uh, long term objective. So, I, I there has been a question in the, um, in the uh, chat and and I, from Shamas uh, Ureman Tour. Uh, and and uh, you provided a, a, a brief uh, response, uh, Taeyong. But but so, so the question is uh, uh, about um, are we you know we, we want to have better coordination uh, among the MDBs and and uh, and w w what could countries do to achieve this? And of course we have uh, had this notion of, of country platforms and 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 creating. Uh, platforms where you can bring on, on board you know, the multilateral development banks, the, the national development banks that uh, Professor Xu was talking about, and and, and also uh, hopefully the private sector, maybe even also the philanthropic sector, and, and of course uh, coordinate that with, with uh, the, um, uh, the local uh, or, or the, the, the national uh, ministries uh, of, that are involved in, in in, in various aspects, and there have been a, a lot of discussions about this, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the net zero transition and, and, and climate uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, Mark Carney has a paper on, on, on platforms applied to, to climate. Uh, uh, Taeyong, maybe you can say something uh, about you know, your, your answer to this and how, how we can, uh, how can we improve coordination? Uh, how, what can countries do to to really bring in the private sector better and, and uh, create the, the conditions for, for private sector and also ultimately institutional capital perhaps to also flow into this. Eric, I, I, if, I, if I may be uh, daring enough and uh, to be very short, mm -hmm. I think we have to first change our mindset and mm -hmm. we have to change our roles. I think up to now, whatever public sector driven uh, practice and activity and including MDBs and the national, you know, local public sector. Basically our practice is look, I, this is our guideline and this is the uh, law act so that you guys private sectors and other stakeholders follow us. I think that's the practice. Why don't you change the role? Why don't you allow the private sector 
to lead it, to to let them, you know, let them say some, let them initiate something, and then public sector, including MDBs and AIIB, rather than uh, asking them to follow you guys. I think you guys listen to them and the providing the uh, enabling condition. And obviously there are a lot many successful and failed uh, cases and uh, greenwashing plus some others. Then our next job is obviously, uh, we're gonna filtering all those uh, based on our, uh, you know, the global partnership. But I think the role change let, let's ask the private sector to lead it. Look, last 30 years, we, we couldn't make it successful. So why don't you take the leading role? Then, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe very much their challenge, but I think uh, uh, that's one way to, to engage private sector more uh, actively in this business. Eric, I'm sorry, and I, I, I really have to go, and I'm sorry for the uh, bad connection, and uh, nice to meet you uh, all, uh, the friends. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, thank I you very much. I know you have another engagement and, and uh, on, on uh, similar issues, so, so thank you so much for, for joining us, and, and I think you know, we, we are also running over time. We started a bit late, that's why I have let it go over time, but, but uh, yeah, I think it is a, an interesting idea to, to, to let the the private sector take the lead. I, I so I think the the um, so maybe we'll this will be our sort of my concluding um, remarks and, and thanking all the, all the panelists uh, for for their contributions. I think we have uh, put on the table uh, you know the certainly the issues and, and some radical proposals, including now to to give the lead to the to the private sector. But there is a uh, just uh, very recently, uh, I actually was presented at the uh, at the COP27 in Tramasek, uh, this uh, report from this high level independent panel of the UN Secretary General, which is in a way trying to create the conditions for the private sector to take a, 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 a more leading role. Because I think the what, what we need to, to do for the private sector to play that uh, leading role, we need to create the, uh, the conditions. We need to have your transparency around, you know, what uh, the private sector is doing. We need to agree on, you know, what what is it that they are reporting, uh, for example, in terms of uh, when they set up net zero uh, transition objectives for 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 companies or for their supply chains and, and so on. We need to know what that is about, and 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 I agree very much that this will be incredibly important uh, driver of, of, of change, perhaps the most important driver when we think about how, how can we get the enforcement of decarbonization across countries, getting this through these lead firms of, of global value chains, that they have, they have the capacity to implement these rules uh, in, in different stages across the, the value chain. So definitely there's a, a, a very strong role for for, for these uh, private, uh, by the way, they can sometimes also be, of course, state-owned enterprises. But but the important part is that uh, when you have that role of, as a lead firm in a, in a global value chain, that allows you to implement standards across uh, and, and or along the value chain. And and but we need to know that whatever information is generated at about what companies do or what financial institutions do. We talked about green bonds. It has to be. Uh, the correct information and it has to be information that is that is relevant and and we need to you know with the green bonds we need to make sure that green bonds are actually additional so that it really influence behavior of these institutions that are being financed and, and that's not so much the case today and and we particularly want them to be additional in the countries that we have been focusing on here the emerging and developing countries where unfortunately not in by far uh, not enough uh, finance is going to these countries today. He said, we, Professor Xu, you mentioned you know, that too much of this goes also in, in, in the wrong currencies to say, so we need to try to do something about this as well. But we need to also make sure that when it reaches these countries, it really is additional uh, so that it really um, addresses uh, uh, the challenges of, of climate change. And of course, uh, the next phase where we're by the way, where EIB wants to be involved in in in, uh, in Pakistan is to try to do something about uh, the, the resilience and, and of, of the infrastructure. And, and I think there is another 
the project uh, that uh, we are working with the ADV to try to to uh, um, make that kind of invest. I think it's, it's another example of how we have to go from emergency response to thinking more long term about how we can create uh, resilience. And of course, we should do this with the private sector and also with the philanthropic sector. Can creating these country platforms, I think, is very much um, uh, the future. So thank you so much for participating here. Thank you for uh, engaging on the uh, OCD multilateral development finance uh, report. And, and uh, so um, thank you from, from Tokyo and, and uh, uh, be, be safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.